First of all, <clears throat> greetings to everyone on this World Chimpanzee Day. And it makes me think back to those very early days when Gombe, it was a place where there was just me and it was so magical. Those days have gone forever, but they're with me in my heart. Anyway, here's a series of questions that I've been asked, which I'll try to answer. Um, first of all, the question is, you first arrived at Gombe to conduct your groundbreaking research. What emotions or thoughts overwhelmed you when you encountered a chimpanzee for the very first time? I regret to say feelings of intense frustration and concern because all I got was a glimpse of a chimpanzee quite far away and the moment he or she saw me vanished. And this is what happened for the first four months. The next um, question, when you first observed tool use in chimpanzees, how were animals regarded before you made this observation? Well, that was an exciting day and I can never forget just walking through the forest. It had been raining. I was cold and wet and suddenly I saw a dark shape crouched over a termite mound and looking through my binoculars, I saw that it was David Greybeard, and here he, here he is, David Greybeard. Uh, it's a portrait of him, but a very good one. He was the chimp who first began to lose his fear of me. And so he let me get reasonably close, and through my binoculars, I could see a hand reaching out, picking grass stems, pushing them into a termite mound, slowly withdrawing them and eating off the termites. Sometimes he picked a leafy twig and he had to carefully strip the leaves. So David Greybeard was using and making tools. And why was this so exciting? Because back then, scientists believed that humans and only humans were the tool using animals. In fact, we were defined as man, the tool maker. And so really that changed everything that was a very, very dramatic moment because the National Geographic at that point agreed to fund my continuing research. Initially, I only had money for six months. I mean, after all, I'd never been to college even, but Lewis Leakey, my mentor, managed to get six months money. We'll see how she does. Well, the tool using meant that I could carry on beyond the six months. Does the study of chimpanzees help us to understand human behavior? Well, Louis Leakey wanted someone to study chimpanzees because they are our closest living relative. We share 98.6% of DNA with them. And of course, a lot of our behavior is very much the same. And Louis, Lewis postulated ahead of his time that chimpanzees and humans were probably descended from an ape-like, human-like creature about six million years ago. And he argued if Jane sees behavior in chimpanzees today, similar to humans today, possibly that came with the two species throughout our long evolutionary pathway. And therefore, we share a common origin for much of our behavior. That's so similar, kissing, embracing, holding hands, and all these other things that I've talked about so often. What activities or behaviors in chimpanzees were the most fascinating? And if you could go back to the field, what aspect would you like to learn more about? The answer to that is very definitely chimpanzee culture. When we had that big gathering in 1986 of the people who by then were studying chimps in, I think it was seven different study sites across Africa. When I began, it was just me. And the, the question, questions that we wanted to ask were about chimpanzee behavior. How much behavior was so innately chimpanzee that we see it in different places across Africa? Um, how much might be culturally determined if culture is defined as behavior 
passed from one generation to the next through observation, observational learning. And when I first mentioned culture, of course, I was scorned. I mean, only humans have culture. Now, of course, we know that many animals have culture. And back then, it was very, very, very exciting to see there were different, uh, there were different tool using behaviors. And I won't go into it now, but there are the same um, nuts to crack in different places. And yet chimpanzees in some places don't eat them at all. In other places, they break them open with rocks. And there are some foods that are eaten in some places and the same foods are not touched in others. There's a lot like that. And what I find really fascinating is that quite clearly cultures can be, you know, be, be introduced uh, at any time. And one example, in Gombe, chimpanzees make nests at night and stay there all night. In um, very hot parts of Africa, in Senegal and Mali, where we're studying chimps, um, it's so hot in the day that on moonlit nights, they will forage at night. And the interesting one, which has to be very modern behavior, is in Uganda, where chimpanzees along the Albertine Rift uh, are losing more and more of their habitat to cattle and human development, sugarcane, and so on. And so, because they're losing so much of their food, they have to try new foods, which is unusual, because they're very conservative. So they've taken to crop raiding, and this, of course, is dangerous. So there they have learned to raid for crops on moonlit nights. This is really fascinating. And I would love to study differences in their vocalizations and differences in gestures. We got a little bit of evidence that the same gesture may be used by chimps in different places, but for a different purpose. Next question, um, well, the question was what makes chimpanzees so like us and yet so unique? And the answer is every species is unique. The main difference between us and chimpanzees, and of course there are many, is that we've learned to speak with words. So unlike chimpanzees, we can teach our children about events that are far away and out of sight. We can discuss problems, bringing together people from different disciplines to try and solve those problems. And we can make plans for the distant future. We can share stories about events that happened in the past. And chimpanzees learn by observation. And they have rich communication <coughs> system <coughs> of sounds, postures and gestures, um, but it's not quite the same as our talking. They couldn't, uh, you know, sit around a campfire and tell stories to each other, so far as we know. So <clears throat> that's really fascinating. Um, next question. <clears throat> Among the various behaviors exhibited by chimpanzees, do you have a personal favorite? If so, what makes it particularly intriguing to you? What I think is so fascinating is the waterfall displays that they perform, sometimes not always, and particularly the males when they approach one of these waterfalls in Gombe. The stream is shallow and narrow. Um, normally they jump over it. But um, because it's been falling for thousands of years, I suppose, it's, this wood, waterfall has carved a channel in the hard rock. And so as the water falls down through this channel, 80 feet to the rocky stream bed below, it displaces the air. And so there's always a breeze making the vines ripple. And it also, especially in the wet season, it's very loud. And so sometimes you see the chimpanzees approaching and their hair begins to, to bristle. And then they, they're very quiet, but as they get close, they stand upright, often in the water. 
and they're throwing rocks ahead of them, sometimes giving low, ooh, 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 not, not always, sometimes they're totally silent. And then they'll do this for 10 minutes or more. And I've seen them climb up vines beside the, beside the waterfall, and they're in the breeze from the waterfall, and the vines are swaying. And at the end, if you're lucky and you can see the eyes, you'll see a chimpanzee sitting and he's looking where the water comes from, 80 feet up. His eyes are following it down and then following it as it flows away. So here, if chimpanzees had language, if they could speak to each other with, with words uh, and they could discuss this amazing phenomena, which I think gives them a feeling of awe, wonder, such as we have, then that could give rise to one of the early uh, animistic religions when people worshipped the sun, the stars, the moon, and waterfalls, things that they couldn't understand. Um, next question. Throughout your remarkable career, can you share a specific encounter or moment with chimpanzees that left a lasting impression on you? Well, many of you will know this story I was following David Greybeard. Here he is again in those very early days. And um, he pushed his way through a thick tangle of vegetation, all thorny, and I tried to follow, but I got tangled up. And so it took some time, and I thought, oh, well, David will be long gone. But he was actually sitting and looking back. It looked as if he was waiting for me. Maybe he was, I don't know. But anyway, I sat down near him and on the ground between us was a ripe red palm nut, which the chimpanzees love. So I picked it up and I held it out towards him on my hand and he turned his face away. So I pushed my hand closer and he turned and looked directly into my eyes. Then he reached out, he took and dropped the nut with one motion and very gently squeezed my fingers. And that's how chimpanzees <clears throat> reassure each other. So in that one moment, we understood each other with gestures and signals that presumably predate words, something that we might see in our primitive ancestors. <clears throat> the next question, in order to safeguard chimpanzee habitats, what must be done? Well, of course, legislation setting land aside uh, as protected areas is really important. But when I first flew over Gombe National Park in 19, the late 1980s, it had been part of the Great Forest Belt across Africa. And by the late 80s, uh, it was just an island of forest I looked down on. All around were bare hills. There were more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, struggling to survive, cutting down the trees because they needed more land to grow more food or they needed money from charcoal or timber. And so that's when it hit me. If we don't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying their environment, then we can't save chimpanzees, forests, or anything else. And so that led to the JGI program, Takari, which you can Google and find out all about. Actually, don't Google it, Ecosia it. Ecosia, every time you use the Ecosia um, network, which is basically the same as Google, then they plant a tree for you. So I love Ecosia. <coughs> Next question, what makes chimpanzees so vital to their ecosystems and other eco ecosystems as they're all interconnected? Well, chimpanzees are gardeners like the other great apes and some of the big birds like hornbills. They eat fruits from high up in the canopy and as it passes through their digestive tract, many of the seeds, seeds emerge whole and are dropped in feces onto the forest floor so they can regenerate new trees of these species and move them away so that they get a new start uh, in different parts of the forest. 
And of course, this is good. It's regenerating the forest for all the other species who live there. Um, next question, why are chimps endangered? Because they are all the species, some very endangered, like in West Africa. They're endangered for various reasons. Probably number one, habitat destruction. The forests are being destroyed so fast, it's so frightening. And uh, there's mining companies coming in, there's companies drilling for oil and gas, uh, companies looking for gold, so on. And then human population growth moving further and further into the habitat with their cattle. And this is very destructive to the environment. Chimpanzees are also endangered by the bushmeat trade. That's the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, very different from subsistence hunting, where you just hunt enough to feed you and your family or your village. And in some countries, chimpanzee meat is eaten. In other places, it's never touched. Um, <clears throat> then there's also snares set by hunters, usually to catch bush pigs or, or antelopes, and a chimp may get a hand or foot entangled in one of these snares. The snares used to be made of vines, in which case the chimp could break them. But the wire snares used today cannot be broken as the chimp pulls, the snare tightens, and this may end in the chimpanzee either getting gangrene or losing a hand or foot. So that in some parts like Uganda, <clears throat> many chimps go around uh, having lost a hand, two hands once, um, or a foot. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the live animal trade. Mothers are shot to steal the babies, to sell them overseas as pets or for entertainment. Next question. I've heard that taking selfies with chimpanzees is discouraged. Could you shed some light on the reasons behind this advice? And I've heard that chimpanzees shouldn't be kept as pets. Why is it important to refrain from these kind of things? Well, taking selfies is usually with chimpanzees in zoos or chimpanzees used for entertainment. And we shouldn't be in close contact with chimpanzees like that. And also it's disrespectful. Chimpanzees, you know, they don't want this, this selfie. We want it, but they don't. So it's just not good. It makes people think chimpanzees are little cuddly creatures. And as for pets, well, they're taken from their, from their mothers, their families, their groups. Um, they're dressed in human clothes. Oh, they're cute as babies. But then they begin to grow up. They don't want to be uh, a human child in a human house. They've got chimpanzee instincts and they can become very dangerous. Oh, and finally, of course, um, chimpanzees taken from their mothers at a young age um, find it very, very difficult to be introduced into a chimpanzee group. Some of them never acquire <coughs> the normal adult chimpanzee behavior. Um, Next question, what do you wish people felt when they see chimpanzees or understood the threats that face them in the wild or in captivity? Well, I just hope that people seeing this, understanding a bit more about chimp behavior, um, will want to help. And how can they help? Well, joining an organization that protects chimpanzees in the wild, like JGI, there are others. Um, we have sanctuaries for orphan chimpanzees, uh, other people do too, and we have chimp guardians, so children save up and they get a photograph of their chimp and they hear stories about how the chimp is getting on. And this is one way of bringing money in. <clears throat> this year we're celebrating hashtag chimpanzee connection. How are chimpanzees connected to other species like humans or other wildlife? Well, it's a strange kind of question, but basically we're connected because we are all part of the animal kingdom. We all depend on healthy ecosystems. 
and as ecosystems are being destroyed one by one across the world, as forests disappear, ecosystems collapse, and as I say, we depend on healthy ecosystems. So, um, saving the ecosystem without it, chimpanzees and other animals will not be able to survive. And lastly, last question, how would you say the phrase, my name is Jane, using chimpanzee uh, calls? And this is the pantoot of greeting. Each chimpanzee has his or her uh, own distinctive voice. It's how they find each other, um, how they call to each other across the valleys. And so my call is obviously distinctive. And it, this is me, me Jane. Well, you've learned some things about chimpanzees. You can learn an awful lot more, but time is running out. So uh, please help us on Chimpanzee Day in any way that you can and send in your ideas as to how you've helped or how someone else could help. Thank you. Bye now.